Um, moved to St. Louis. Um, my husband was from here, he grew up here. And when I first moved here, I was traveling every week, Monday through Thursday. And I, I'm not a huge fan of stereotypes, but my husband is very stereotypically in St. Louis that he has not made a new friend since he was five. And then we, um, um, we got pregnant and it was the most joyous occasion, but that nine months of pregnancy was really isolating and it, it really hit rock bottom when the baby came and it really should have been the most joyous time in our life. You know, we, this new baby, everyone has, you know, just these wonderful images of what a great mom you're going to be and how this is going to bring you closer together. And it wasn't like that for me. It was um, a really low, dark place and I just was extremely isolated. And my sister told me to Google a mom's group, and the first thing that came up was MOPS. And um, MOPS is a ministry um, to, the motto is, better moms make a better world. And it, that spoke to me, because I was not being a good mom. And so um, I called the leader at the time of MOPS, and she invited me to the first meeting, and I came, and that moment changed my life. It, pulled me out of this hole that I was in and I felt like myself and I was surrounded by women who really cared about me and they didn't care if I breastfed or bottle fed or if I let my baby cry it out or if they, you know, what my mothering style was. These are the women that are with me who make me a better wife, a better mom, a better disciple, a better citizen, a better person all around. And through MOPS, um, one of the mentors, uh, Renita Wold, who's like the fourth best person on the face of the planet, she invited me to come to church here. And we came in and we instantly knew that this was our church home. And to look at this puzzle in hindsight, it's like, wow, this all happened in God's timing. You know, had we visited this church before I knew Renita, would this have been where we ended up? MOPS and everything, just, just being here just really, um, I mean, it shapes who we are, and it, it's so important, but it's, it's allowed me to grow so much because I'm obviously an outgoing person. I love to serve. I love to be surrounded by people, and there's just so many opportunities here, you know, and it has just fulfilled that void in my life, and I'm just that dark place I was in, you know, three years ago. It's just, that doesn't exist to me anymore. Must have a lot of born and raised in St. Louis people here today because that was hilarious when she said, typical St. Louis and hasn't made a friend since five. Y'all don't know yourselves, but I'm going to help you with that today because um, that's what we're here to talk about. We're in this series called Be Someone where we're talking about the power of intentional relationships. And uh, today, as I mentioned, we're, we're going to talk about how important it is if you want to intentionally invest in other people for their good, for your good, how important it is for you to know yourself. Now, I'm, I'm Dion. I'm one of the teaching pastors here. I want to welcome you if you're a guest with us today. If you're joining us online, we also are so glad to have you. Um, before I dive into this topic today, I do want to pause for another moment and pray. So pray with me, please. Father, I thank you for the way that you know us, for the way you know us intimately. I think of those words from Psalm 139 and how you knew us before we ever were. And Father, you know our stories. You know exactly what we need today. You know the needs that are on our hearts as, as we come into this place. And so, Father, I pray that you'd meet us in our need. I pray that you'd speak clearly to each and every one of us, to our situations. Um, whatever is going on in our lives, have a word for us. But Lord, also help us understand the importance, continuing, uh, continue to understand the importance of being someone, of investing in people, and how you can use that for just amazing things beyond our imagination. Pray this all in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, those who know me pretty well know uh, that I am an inventory junkie. Now, now, what's that, an inventory junkie? That is not a new politically correct name for being a hoarder. I'm not one of those things. I guess you could, you could, you could say that that would be another way to think about an inventory junkie. The kind of inventory, inventory I'm talking about are um, personal or personality inventories. Do you know what I mean? You've taken some of them. I've taken all of them, and I want to share with you a little bit about me for my personality inventories. The first, a good old Myers-Briggs. On Myers-Briggs, I am an ENTP. How, how many of you know Myers-Briggs and have some understanding of what these letters mean? Yeah, I'm an extrovert, intuitive, thinking, and perceiving. Uh, that goes together to be a, um, a profile they call a strategic inventor. So that's part of, of who I am. Strengths finder? Anyone know Strengths finder? 
Okay, there are like 10 of you who do, so 10 of you will know what this means. Um, my strengths are ideation, strategic, learner, activator, and maximizer. Those are my strengths, finder results. DISC assessment, anyone know DISC? Yep, um, DISC, I'm results-oriented type, which means I'm a very high D, a moderate I, and C, and a low S. I'm sure you all know what that means. Um, how about spiritual gifts? You've heard of spiritual gifts before? Here are mine. Teaching, evangelism, and prophecy, which sounds kind of scary, but um, especially that prophecy thing. That means I know your secrets. Um, that's not actually what it means at all, but uh, th I'll talk, save that for another day. Uh, there's another assessment called the Standout Assessment. It's, it's put out by Gallup, um, and they give you different primary roles that you serve in an organization. Mine are equalizer and advisor. And then there's a brand new assessment that just came out. It's currently, the book is currently on the New York Times bestseller list. It's called How the World Sees You. And it's called Your Fascination Advantage, which sounds fascinating, doesn't it? So uh, I took it and a bunch of other people on our staff took it. And I am known as a, a type called the Maverick Leader, which is a combination of, of the two advantages of innovation and power. And Tim Ryman, our, our uh, music director who was standing over there playing guitar, um, he is the catalyst. Brent Hunsinger, who was up here doing MCing, he is, he is known as the maestro, which I think is a great term for the creative director for worship. Um, but that's mine. I am so obsessed about profiling and inventorying that I've taken every kind that I can find. I even know which Disney princess I am. <laughs> and sadly, I'm not joking. Anyone want to guess? Come on, guess. I've already told you I took the profile, so you can't embarrass me any worse than I've already embarrassed myself. What's your guess? Why is it always Ariel? <laughs> three out of three for Ariel. The qu choir as my witness, right? Three out of three is Ariel. Uh, no, not Ariel. A uh, good guess. I'm um, not Ariel. Um, I'm actually, I'm all Jasmine. <laughs> I think I'd look good in harem pants, don't you? Um, uh, Jasmine. See, I, now, some of you think, all right, this guy is a narcissist. He's totally self-obsessed. I don't think that's the case, although you should probably ask my wife just to be sure. Uh, she'll give you all the truth on me. Um, th the thing is about this is, is I just think it's really important that I know myself because as I live life, I realize that I am the hardest person for me to get to know. And the same is true for you. You are the hardest person for you to get to know. Now, it seems like it should be easy to know yourself because you live in your own skin, but that's exactly what makes it difficult, is that you have no perspective, you've got no objectivity, and you've got no distance when it comes to yourself. And so it's very, very hard for you to know yourself, but it's very, very important, especially if you want to be someone. Now, for some of you already, like, you know, your, your, your sensors are going off and you're just going, this isn't right. We should not be talking about this in church. This is like pop psychology of the 1960s. What does this have to do with church, with God, with the Bible? And if that's you today, I just want to reassure you that the Bible actually says a lot about the importance of knowing yourself. I, I'm not going to go in depth, but I just want to highlight a few things for you. The first one comes from Proverbs. It says, the purposes of a, of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. So it says that, that man, our hearts are like, are like deep, deep water. And in Missouri, we don't understand that. We don't understand like deep lakes. I'm talking about good spring-fed lakes. We don't get that. Um, I'm from Michigan. We've got good lakes there, okay? Um, but uh, in, in Proverbs, it says that, man, your heart is like a deep, deep, uh, deep, deep lake, deep waters, and only a person of true insight can draw that out. So again, it's saying, hey, th there's something important about drawing out what's inside of you. It's, it's important to know yourself. Uh, the next one, Paul talks in, in uh, writing to another pastor, a guy named Timothy. He says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So uh, we, we often, if we know this verse, we think about watch your doctrine, you know, watch what you teach, Timothy. But Paul also says, watch your life, you know. Pay attention to what's going on in you and what's going on with you. Again, you've got to know yourself. And then Paul again writes in Romans, he says this. He says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Now this is where we often pause and we go, see, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought which we tend to think of as saying, don't think of yourself at all, but that's not what he says. He says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So yeah, think of yourself, but do it with sober judgment, with a faith-filled attitude. 
See, all over the Bible, there, there are these instructions that we should know ourselves. We should look within. We should understand who we are. The book of, the, of Ecclesiastes, if you've heard of Ecclesiastes, a guy named Solomon is writing this book, and it's this pursuit of God, yes, but also this pursuit of understanding more about who God has made him to be. So I want you to know here today that, that it's okay for us to talk about this in church. But more than being okay, I, I want to tell you why we must talk about this in church and why we must talk about it today as a part of this series. Because if you don't know yourself, if you don't become a student of yourself, then not only will you not experience a lot of fulfillment in, in a lot of parts of life, but if you don't know yourself, you will never be able to be someone to another person in any meaningful way. You know, I love the story that we heard of, of, from Julie just a second ago on, on the video and talking about how Renita invested in her. And I'll tell you, it, unless we get to know ourselves and become comfortable with who we are, we will never fully be able to invest in another person in a way that will change their life. And today, to, uh, to emphasize this, I want to show you, introduce you to, rather, um, two people, one named Priscilla, one named Aquila. They're actually a married couple. And I, I want to show you how, because of their just firmly rooted knowledge of themselves, how God used them to be someone to another person in a very, very powerful way. So their story starts in about Acts chapter 18. So if you want to open up your Bible or take out your smart device right now and go to uh, uversion.com, you can do that. The words are going to be up here on the screen. I'll just let you know we're going to kind of jump through Acts 18 because we're just tracing out a Priscilla and Aquila, and there's some other stuff that goes on there. But we're going to start right at the very top of the chapter, starting at verse 1. It says, after this, Paul, uh, Paul is, uh, man, the key leader of the New Testament movement. Paul left a city called Athens, and he went to another place called Corinth. While he was in Corinth, he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla. So they just moved there, and, and I'll tell you why. Because Claudius, the emperor, had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. He had expelled all Jewish people from the city of Rome. So Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, Paul reasoned in the synagogues, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks um, about Jesus being the Messiah. So, so Paul goes to this new city, and immediately he meets this couple, Priscilla and Aquila. And, and did you notice how he first came to know them? How they first kind of developed a relationship? Um, last week we heard Andy Audette talk about focusing on a few and how we've all got lots of relationships. We don't need more. What we often need is more focus. You can't be someone to everyone, but you can be someone to a few people. And so he gave us at the end of his message, he gave us three things that we can look for when we're trying to figure out who to focus on. And he talked about affinity. He talked about being attentive just to kind of the people who are around us. And then he talked about looking for people uh, who have potential. And, and I look at Paul with Priscilla and Aquila, and immediately there was a strong affinity there because they had the same trade. Did you notice what it was? They were both tent makers. They both made tents. And so right off, Paul and uh, Priscilla and Aquila, they have this in common. They have the same trade. They do the same thing for a living. Not only that, but they're both newcomers to this city of Corinth, right? Priscilla and Aquila had come from Rome. Paul had just come from Athens. He's been moving around the, the whole uh, Roman world, but he had just come into the city. And, and you know how this is if you've ever relocated uh, when you relocate somewhere, you, you have no relationships, and you look around, and most of the people have lots of relationships. And so when you can find someone else who also has no relationships, there's some affinity there. You're both starting from scratch, and there's a lot of openness. Well, not only that, not only do they have the same trade, not only are they both new in town, but they're both no stranger to religious persecution. I mean, Priscilla and Aquila were ordered out of their hometown because of their faith, because they were Jewish people and the emperor deemed Jews as a threat to their stability, so he threw them out of, the, out of Rome. And Paul, and Paul had been thrown out of lots of cities. That guy's been thrown out of more places than anyone you know, even that crazy cousin of yours who drinks too much. Like, Paul got thrown out of lots of places, and, and so these people have all of this affinity, and immediately they become friends, and Paul becomes a resident in their house. He starts staying with them, which, as we heard last week, is, is a great way to get to know someone. He learned their bathroom habits and everything, and they even become business partners. Now, some of you have gone into business with friends or family, and you know how difficult that is, but, but Paul and Priscilla and Aquila, they make it work. 
Their friendship goes on. It, it becomes very deep. But then time goes on, and Paul does what Paul does, which means that he leaves and he goes somewhere else. So as Paul's preparing to end his time in Corinth, I, I want you to see what happens. This is starting at verse 18. It says, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Um, we know that he actually stayed there for at least a year and a half, which was a long time for Paul. So Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters there, and he sailed for Syria. But get this, he was accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Now, I just want you to think about this for a second. Um, Priscilla and Aquila, these crazy people, decide that they are going to pick up their life and follow Paul. They're actually going to move across the ocean, literally. You can see up here there's a big map. Corinth is way over on the left. Going across the sea, they're going to end up in Ephesus. So um, they're, they're going to pick up, move across the sea, and go somewhere else. Now, I want you to think for a second. Just ask yourself, what kind of relationship would, would convince you? What, you know, what would that relationship have to look like for you to be convinced that you should pick up your life, move across the sea, and follow someone over there to continue his work? To be a part of this mission? I mean, it shows you the depth of their connection that they were willing to actually do this. So um, they, they decide they're going to go with him. Uh, and then we get some weird information here. Um, before Paul sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centrea because of a vow he had taken. This is just some obscure religious practice. When you, when you take a vow, you'd cut off your hair, which I think could still be a great practice. It would surely cut down on random New Year's resolutions, right? If you had to cut off your hair as you made those vows to give up chocolate or whatever else you do. Um, so, so it's just kind of some weird detail. Before they set sail, Paul cuts his hair. But, but get this. They arrive at Ephesus across the ocean where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. Continue. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it's God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. So you get this, these people follow Paul across the ocean, they get to Ephesus, all is good, and Paul says, see ya, I'm leaving, I'm heading back to Jerusalem, and uh, he gets on a ship and goes. He totally abandons these guys, some friend, right? Actually, what's, what's really happening here is that Paul had been investing in this couple for, for about two years now, and now it's their turn, he's setting them loose to invest in others, to be someone to other people. So here they are living in Ephesus, it's the fourth largest city in the empire. Very important seaport. And uh, they're there making tents. And they're telling people about Jesus, that he is in fact the Christ. And they're living life, not without Paul, but as Paul's representatives there in that city. And then, as Paul leaves, a new guy comes into town. Another guy that I want to introduce you to, his name is Apollos. So we're going to look at verse 24. I want to introduce you to this new guy, Apollos. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, that's in Egypt, uh, you know, a city of great learning. Alexandria was known to have this, this uh, ancient library. It's the center of learning of, of the whole Roman Empire. Um, so he's a native of Alexandria. He came to Ephesus, and he was a learned man. He was from Alexandria with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though... He knew only the baptism of John. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that later. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So, so you got this, this new guy comes into town, Apollos, and Apollos is all Ivy League, right? And then you've got Priscilla and Aquila, and they're just these meek tent makers, and you'd, you'd think, well, what do these two people have in common? Nothing, right? And Apollos, he's this really gifted guy. He's been taught a lot. He's learned a lot. He's from this very scholarly city. And he teaches with authority. And people are, are listening to him. And he's very compelling. But as Priscilla and Aquila hear him, they realize that he, he doesn't have all the right stuff in his teaching. He's, he's, he's missing out, leaving out, rather, some very important parts. It says that he knew only the baptism of John, which may not sound like a big deal, but it's actually a huge deal because Apollos is going around preaching about Jesus, but he's still baptizing people only for the repentance of their sins. See, that's the way John the Baptist baptized people. 
He baptized people for repentance. It was a symbolic baptism. It was a way of, of saying, hey, I'm done with my sinful ways. I'm turning my ways toward, you know, a, a new direction, and I'm going to wash myself clean of my former ways. It was, it was just a symbol of a repentant heart. And Apollos is teaching this kind of symbolic baptism rather than what we would call a sacramental baptism, which is a baptism of regeneration and rebirth, a baptism of, of, of death and new life that goes on forever. I mean, this is a very, very big deal. And so Priscilla and Aquila, they, they hear that this guy's still talking about the baptism of John, and, and he doesn't know about the baptism of Jesus, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and so what do they do? They invite him over. They feed him dinner. And they begin to teach him the way of God more adequately. It's like things come full circle because they invited Paul over, and Paul sat in their house and taught them, and now they're inviting Apollos over, but now they're the teachers, and they're teaching him. Now, now how does this happen? You know, blue-collar folk schooling Mr. Harvard. Now, how does that happen? Well, that happens all the time in life, doesn't it? Which brings me to, to something that I think is so important for us here today. Um, two of the barriers that we so often face in being someone are not just the busyness that Steve Howard talked about a couple of weeks ago as he kicked off this series, but two additional bar barriers that we all face that, that limit how God wants to use us in the life of others are these two things, intimidation and insecurity. Intimidation and insecurity. Intimidation is about who other people are. Insecurity is about who we are. Now, now think about intimidation for a second. Apollos, he's this, this guy who I told you, he's Ivy League, he's Mr. Harvard, he's, he comes into town and he is eloquent and he is provocative and, and people want to listen to him. And meanwhile, Priscilla and Aquila, they're just kind of these ordinary people that Paul left behind to help the work of the church and, and you know, they could easily feel upstaged. Because Apollos is, uh, you can just imagine him, he's about six foot two, good looking. He has this really swanky accent. You know, everyone's talking about him. He's just this really impressive guy. It would be so easy to be intimidated by Apollos. And I, I think the truth is that if we were in their shoes, few of us would ever strike up a friendship with a guy like Apollos. We'd be too intimidated. And the result of intimidation is that we end up making friends with only people who are like us. We drastically limit the kind of people that we're willing to invest in, right? So, so um, your friends, and chances are, just think about your friendships right now, your friends probably are all about as educated as you. They probably make about the same money that you do. Um, they, they're probably about as good looking as you are, right? And, and if they're way ahead of you in one of those things, you, you gotta make sure that you trump them in something else, otherwise you're probably not gonna be their friend, right? That's how we do friendships. Be because no one wants to be friends with someone who they feel inferior around all the time. But for whatever reason, this wasn't an issue for Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, you know, they, they weren't intimidated by Apollos, or if they were, they, they got over it. And so they, they invest in this guy. Uh, let's talk about insecurity for a minute. You know, again, uh, intimidation is about who other people are. Insecurity is about who we are. And insecurity comes, I think, because we don't know ourselves. We don't really know how God has gifted us. We don't understand th the uniqueness that God has put into us, our own unique experiences, or our own ability to make unique contributions. And the result when you're insecure is that you never put yourself out there. You won't take risks in relationships. Because you'll constantly be thinking, oh, you know, what, what do I know? And, and sure that person, I'm sure that person could find more interesting friends than me, or, or they may need help, but, but man, someone else probably would be more well-suited to help them. But, but I love this, that Priscilla and Aquila, they're not victim to either one of these things. They seem to know who they are enough. They know Jesus enough. They look at Apollos and they realize that he's just a new guy in town. He's a guy on the same team. He's a guy who needs help because he's missing an important part of his teaching. See, I think none of us would even see that about Apollos. We'd just assume that he had everything together and we'd feel inferior. Or if we saw that vulnerability in his teaching, we'd just kind of zip our lips and wait for him to step in it so that he'd get knocked down a, a, a notch or two and then we could feel better about ourselves, right? But man, not Priscilla and Aquila. Just kind of different people. 
They, they invest in this guy, and I want you to see what happens as a result of their investment. Take a look. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, he wanted to move on to another place. He's feeling a call to tear, take, take the gospel all over the world. The brothers and sisters in Ephesus, in Ephesus encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there, and they said, hey, welcome him. He's a good guy. When Apollos arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Do you see what happened here? See, Apollos, and he, go, he, he goes on, and, and he becomes this force to be reckoned with for the sake of the gospel. He starts traveling along to, to these other cities, and he is so gifted, and he's such a great debater. And now that he's got a more adequate teaching, he's able to refute and debate these people who are adversaries of the Christian faith, and he's proving to them that Jesus is the Christ. Do you get the picture here? Because Priscilla and Aquila weren't victim to intimidation and insecurity— because they were willing to invest in this guy that God put right in front of them, they make him a stronger vessel for God, and people come to know Jesus all over the Roman world because of what they did for Apollos. Do you see how powerful this is? Now here's the thing. In order to have that kind of boldness, in order to uh, just be willing to be someone to anyone that God directs you to, you have to know yourself, which, as I've said, is so, so difficult. But here's how you can grow in a healthy knowledge of yourself. I'm going to give you three ways today, and uh, I encourage you to take notes of how you can grow in knowing yourself. The first is uh, pretty obvious. Be open to feedback. Be open to feedback. Now, the truth is, most of us aren't very open to feedback. Uh, there may be 1% of us who, who just love getting feedback, but most of us aren't. Uh, most of us tend to be pretty protective when it comes to feedback. I'll admit that that's, that's the person I am. Sometimes I'm standing down here on, on weekends after services and someone approaches me and uh, they're walking up the aisle and I can see they're coming for me. And I can tell you that in my spirit, I'm not just open to whatever they have to say. There, there's a part of me that, that just starts to guard myself because I go, uh-oh, what is this? Is this a happy person or a sad person or a displeased person? Do they have a bone to pick with me or, or what? And I've been that way ever since I was little. You know, I, I realize now that I've never been a very open person when it comes to feedback in my life. I've always been afraid of feedback. I've always, I've always taken feedback too deeply to heart. And, you know, if someone praised me ten times and they gave me one bit of critical feedback, I would assume that all the rest of it was for nothing and that I was a miserable failure, you know. And so as I've grown, I've, I've prayed this because I realize that if you're not open to feedback, you can't grow. You can't get better. You can't even know yourself. And so my prayer now for me, and, and I talk to my kids and pray with them about this, uh, or pray this for them all the time, I say, God, just give me a teachable spirit. Make me open. So when we talk about being open to feedback, for most of us, we tend to think of that constructive criticism, which, which is a great gift that someone could give you. If, if someone speaks critically to you, chances are, not always, but, but, but the majority of the time, they love you enough to tell you something important about yourself. And we've all been on the other side where you know someone and someone needs to tell them about themselves, but you're like, you know, drawing straws to say, who wants to do it? Because no one wants to be that person. Now, constructive criticism is important, and I'd encourage you to be open to that. But, but today I want to take it a step further, and I want to encourage you not only to listen to how people critique you constructively, but I want to challenge you to do something that I think is even harder. I want to challenge you to listen to how people praise you. And that's hard sometimes, isn't it? I mean, someone gives you a compliment, and, uh, and you're like Wonder Woman with those cuffs, you know, deflecting. Right? That's what we do. We may let a little bit of that compliment come in, but we spend a lot of time just going, no, that's not true, or that's not me, or oh, gosh, you're so kind, you're just being generous. But, but I'm telling you, if, if you're open to feedback, and if you're willing to listen to how people praise you, you will learn a lot about how God has gifted you. And maybe it's not even how God has gifted you. Maybe it's just how God is using your experiences, your life, your story to bless others. So, so uh, you know, the first thing I'll say, it's up here, is, is be open to feedback. How people critique you, but how people praise you. And don't just be open in a passive way. If you really want to grow in knowledge of yourself, 
invite it. You know, find a few trusted people and say, hey, how could I do this better? Or how could I grow? And also tell me, what is it that you see about me that, that only I can do? What is the way that God has uniquely gifted me? Chances are they can see it. And if you, if you trust them, if you believe them, if you're willing to open up your heart to feedback, you begin to learn a lot about how God has uniquely designed you and gifted you. So be open to feedback. The next thing is this. Make peace with your past. You got to make peace with your past. Now this is important for all of your life, to make peace with your past. But it's also important if you're going to grow past intimidation and insecurity and you're going to be someone to the people that God puts before you. And here's why. Because when you're afraid of your past, when there's stuff in your past that you're ashamed about, you feel guilt-stricken about, when there are mistakes in your past that you are afraid to face or own, you will never have the courage to look inside of yourself. You'll, you'll always be afraid of, of opening up those doors to, to the past. But see, that's not how God wants you to live. I mean, do you realize that God wants you to be at peace with your past, with your present, with your future? I mean, do you know that that's what Jesus came to do, to bring you peace? Do you realize those were the first words out of his mouth at the resurrection? He said, peace I give to you. Do you realize that no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, God's word says that you are now, if you are in Christ, if you've been baptized in the name of Jesus, you are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what's in your past. God has now given you a new name. He's called you by a new identity. Do you realize that when God looks at your life, he doesn't see your failure, he doesn't see your mistakes, he doesn't dwell on that stuff, he doesn't want you to either. So he doesn't want you to wallow in self-hatred and shame and regret. He wants you to have peace. He paid for your peace, and he paid not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. He paid a high price for your peace. He's bought it. It's paid for. He wants you to have what he's paid for you to have. Do you know that today? Yeah, praise God for that. It's true. And if you, don't, if you don't know that, if you don't know that, you're never going to have freedom in life. You're never going to have the fullness that God wants for you to have. And you're never going to be free of intimidation and insecurity so that you can experience the joy of being someone to another person. So, so here's an action step I'd give you. If you're struggling to make peace with your past, here it is. Begin to tell people about it. And by that I mean work on your story, write your testimony, whatever you want to call it. But begin to, in your own mind, look at how God has taken who you've been, who you were, even who you are today, and how God is at work in your life to change all of that. See, as you start to work on that story and as you start to just reflect on God's rescue over you, on God's redemption of your life and how he's making it into something else, as you begin to declare God's rescue over you, you will begin to have peace in your life. It will become truer and truer that, yes, Jesus died for me so that I could have peace, but that peace will start to seep into your life the more you declare it, the more you tell people about it. I mean, Paul said, hey, I will boast in my weaknesses because in my weakness then he is strong. So again, if you're someone who struggles to make peace with your past, Begin to tell the story of your past. Begin to write that narrative. Begin to, to work on your testimony. Share it with some people whom you trust. And as you declare the story of God's work in your life, it will bring you freedom. It will bring you peace. And then the last thing we'll say is this. Celebrate your brand of uniqueness. Celebrate your brand of uniqueness. See, I think if I gave you enough time, if I put you on the spot, I bet you could think of some of the ways that you are unique. I bet you could think of some of the, the parts of your giftedness that are, are not like everyone else's. I, I bet if I gave you time and I really made you, you know, pushed away all the false modesty and all that stuff, and I said, come on, t tell me some of the things that God has done in your story that, that you just think are unique. I bet you could think of some of those things. I bet you could even tell stories about how God has used you in the, life, in the lives of others in the past. But, but here's the problem. I think we know a lot about our unique brand of how God has made us, I think the problem is we just don't value it. 
Because in life, we're too busy looking around at what other people do, and we look at their uniqueness, and we celebrate other people's uniqueness, not our own. And so we say, hey, man, I wish I could sing like that or play music like that or stand up and talk in front of people like that or, or I wish I could be a better student like she is or I wish I could be the life of the party, the person who everybody loves like, like he is. And I wish I could be popular, and I wish I could be pretty, and I wish I could... Right? We spend so much time downplaying our unique brand of, of giftedness and envying others. But let me just remind you, God doesn't make junk, does he? No way. I mean, God made you intentionally, and God's power is so great that, that even your crazy, messed up, quirky story, God can redeem that story and use that story for amazing things beyond your imagination. So here's what I tell you to do. If you struggle to celebrate your brand of uniqueness, I, I, I'll take you back to what I said at the beginning. Take an inventory. You don't have to become an inventory junkie like me, but take an inventory. We even have a free one on our website. So this is how easy we're making this for you. If you go to uh, our website and you click on Next Steps, and then you go to new here, you can find uniquely you, or you can just search at the top of the website, uh, uniquely you, uniquely Y-O-U. -U. It's a free inventory. You'll get your results 24, 48 hours. It's a combination of a disc assessment and a spiritual gifts inventory for those of you who know what that means. It's just a way that you can begin to understand who God has made you, but not only that. See, here's what I love about inventories. Even though you kind of already know that stuff about yourself already, it finally gives you a name for your unique brand of how you've been created. You know, it, it finally gives a name for who you are, and it gives you the ability to celebrate it. So you can say, hey, I may not be able to do all the things that they can do, but now I understand what I can do, and it's called this, and, and I'm going to begin to celebrate this in my life. See, again, the stakes are so high on this, knowing yourself. So I, I hope you wrote those things down. Because I firmly believe that if Priscilla and Aquila had not been so knowledgeable of, about who God was and, and what God was doing in their story and who God made them to be, they never would have been able to invest in Apollos. Apollos never would have been able to travel around the world telling people about Jesus, and the world might have looked differently. But here's one word of warning. For those of you who really like this stuff, maybe too much like me, uh, a couple of months ago on Twitter, I, I saw this quote, and I thought, man, that, that really speaks to me. It's an important warning for all of us as we talk about self-knowledge. And here it is. Introspection and self-examination are essential, but they can become ends in themselves. And when this happens, a person can become so self-absorbed that spiritual formation becomes a journey into self rather than a journey into God. I just want to remind you that, that the point of knowing yourself isn't just a journey into self. The point of all of this is so that we can better do the two most important things that Jesus said any human on earth can do, that is to love God and to love others. And understand this, if, if you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, you need to understand what those things are for you uniquely. You need to know yourself. And if you're going to know how to love your neighbor as yourself, then you need to know yourself. You need to understand how God has uniquely wired you, how God has worked in your story so that you can contribute into the life of another. This is powerful stuff. This is life-changing stuff. And so let me pray for us. Father, again, I'm just reminded of, of how you knew us before we ever were, how you formed us in our mother's womb, and God, how you've been working in our lives ever since. God, give us the courage and the vision that's required for us to see ourselves more like you see us. To push past intimidation and insecurity so that we can begin to invest in love and pour into people whom you place before us. God, who knows how you want to use us in this room? I mean, you could use us to invest in someone who goes on and, and changes the world, the, the next Mother Teresa or the next Apollos or, or the next Billy Graham, who knows, God? But this we do know and this we believe, that you've got a plan and purpose for our lives and that plan is relationships. So God, give us greater courage in our relationships so that we can be more bold, 
But God, give us boldness and give us courage by helping us become more at peace, celebrating who you've made us to be. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Please stand.